Um, a couple quick ones, and then I'll hand it to Weston for some logistics here. But um, I want to thank Anthony, our, our, our national sales manager at Sodic here. Uh, he should be in us shortly. I'm not sure if he's on here. Atlanta, if you can hear me, thank you. But um, he's sort of the sponsor of all this, you know, all these webinars here. And, and uh, again, Sodic's national sales manager. So thanks, Len. Um, on the screen with myself um, is, is Weston Harbaugh. He's going to be our host uh, this afternoon and kind of take care of some of the, you know, Q&A and, and stuff as it come in, comes in. And, and he's been, you know, responsible for setting this whole thing up. So thanks, Weston. Uh, he's also our, our sales engineer for the East Coast for Sodic. Uh, so thanks again. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, so maybe I'll do a quick introduction. I, I don't want to take too much time. I know Kevin's got a lot to discuss here. So we've got Kevin Roddinghouse here today. Kevin, thanks for joining us. He's uh, the regional sales manager for Beaumont and, and the, the AIM Institute, uh, I believe, for just over 10 years now. I, I think Kevin's been doing this. So uh, really, really well known and, and really well respected in the industry. It, you know, as as is Beaumont and, and the AIM Institute. I'm, you know, I'm sure all you familiar. So um thanks thanks for for doing this for us here we're real excited about this partnership and uh maybe i'll pass to weston here for a, a quick uh again logistics thing on on, on question and answer and, and we'll get started so thanks again for joining everybody hey thanks bennett uh greatly appreciated uh looking forward to today's and and the future ones like bennett mentioned uh quickly you can see on the screen here um as kevin has mentioned on his slide. We have you all muted. Um, that That is so the background noise is eliminated so that we're able to um, get through his presentation. We will ask at the end, there'll be a 10, 15 minutes for question and answers. Ask that you send them to myself as the host um, and then as they come in, we'll start to read them off to Kevin during that time and let him spend a little bit of time on each one. Um, I guess that that's really it as maybe a little more on myself as uh, Bennett mentioned, I do handle New England region and a portion of the East Coast for SODIC as well as some of Illinois. And uh, glad to bring this, uh, this webinar series to you guys. Hope you've join some others and if you haven't that uh, maybe you'll join some of the future ones there's a lot of great topics that bennett had mentioned so i guess with that kevin um go ahead i i don't see that len has joined us here i was going to give him a quick minute if he had but i think uh kevin go ahead and take it away excellent uh everybody hopefully can hear me okay um thank you for the introduction sodic team um it's certainly a pleasure uh having the opportunity to present with uh, a lot of your customers and potential customers um it's pretty neat that sodic puts together these these technical talks for the industry um outside of uh just talking about uh their their own technology um i think one thing that we can do as an industry during this uh unusual time is try to learn and innovate as much as possible so that we can you know continue to be efficient at what we're doing and and become better um again my name is kevin roddinghouse with beaumont as bennett mentioned been with uh, beaumont for about 10 years and cover um the the midwest territory i guess um uh for the united states what we want to present today is a presentation on flow grouping um and I'm just gonna jump right into it here to, to keep us moving. So what, what the heck is flow grouping? Um, flow grouping is one of those things that we don't often hear in the industry because it's, it's fairly new. Um, John Beaumont really started talking about this when um, he was learning more about plastic flow himself um, and created a better understanding of how plastic flows in a melt delivery system and in a mold. A flow group is essentially a group of cavities that are receiving identical flow paths and shear history. And we'll get into the specifics of what that means here as we continue. They are created and classified by plastic flow principles. And by identifying these flow groups, we can better ide identify and understand what the root cause of an imbalance is. So when I talk about imbalances, what, what are problems caused by imbalances? 
it's it's kind of a funny thing in our industry. It's it's almost kind of wishy-washy with imbalances. Some people say that they don't matter. Other people uh, really see uh, a lot of issues with imbalances. Sometimes I kind of jokingly, you know, say yeah, it's it's interesting. Sometimes people don't, you know, they'll say it doesn't matter about an imbalance. But the problem is, is that or the thing is, is that everybody always ends up looking at balance, and it's one of the first things that we look at in in, in a multi cavity mold. Because there's a lot of problems that develop as a result of an imbalance. Uh, some cavities that have flash on them, other ones with short shots. Some parts have sink on them, while other ones are fully packed out. We end up with inconsistent weights, inconsistent packing, uh, low dimensional stability. So we see our, our CPKs uh, spread out. Longer cycle times will we'll get clogged vents in some cavities and not others. Uh, some parts with voids, uh, other parts that are burning uh, while other cavities are not. Um, we end up with higher system pressures as a result of this hydrostatic condition where we have some cavities that are fully filled out while other ones are not. Uh, poor process control. Nobody likes an imbalanced mold. Why? Because it leaves us with a narrower process window. Uh, if you had a choice of processing a single cavity tool versus a multi-cavity tool, everybody in the industry would go, well, I want the single cavity mold. Why? Because it doesn't have necessarily an imbalance from cavity to cavity. It's just one cavity. It's harder to process multi-cavity tools because often our transfer positions within the cavity, moving from our first stage velocity fill to second stage pack, differ. And that ends up creating possibly different parts. And we don't want to do that when we're trying to mold multiple cavity tools, because the idea is to get the exact same part, exact same part out of every given cavity. How we develop a process in a multi-cavity tool, sometimes, I'm painting with a broad brush here, sometimes it's necessarily a process beyond, or process established specifically for the part in question, but for the mold. What is the process that we can develop where we get the most uniform cavities? where we might develop a completely different process if we were, say, looking at just a single cavity tool, because then we're in the best interest of just that part. So sources of filling imbalances are, are the next topic. I mean, all, the, the, the neat thing is, is that all filling imbalances are a result of non-uniform pressure. It's just identifying what that root cause is of that non-uniform pressure. And the neat thing about when we start looking at things like this is we can apply math. Right, so we can't argue with math. It's just that um, it's it's very black and white. So when we look at what is a result of non-uniform pressure, we can look at a simple change in pressure formula. So if we look at a change in pressure formula, delta P equals eight times our flow rate Q times L our flow length times N our material viscosity variation, and we divide this by pi times the radius of our flow channel compounded to the power of four. So if we look at this, we're, it's, it's, it's easy to identify the variables because we can very easily cross out constants. So eight obviously is a constant. Q is a constant because that is our flow rate being controlled by the injection molding machine. So assuming that your machine is operating fairly well and can maintain a consistent injection velocity from shot to shot, our flow rate is the same every single time. Next constant would be pi, and then the last would be four. So our variables are our length of flow, material viscosity variations, and radius of the flow channel. So if you actually split these two things apart, we have two primary root causes of pressure drop variations. We have steel variations, the length of our flow, and the radius of that flow channel and then rheological variations. And we're gonna get into specifically what both of these mean here next. So the two types of variations that we're gonna concentrate on, steel being first. Steel is a variation that is an imbalance due to a physical problem within the mold or things that influence the tool from an outside standpoint. I'll explain that in a minute. So a steel variation can be things like differences in size of cavities. Obviously that's something that we concentrate on from a mold making standpoint. Gate size is something that is uh, uh, usually a really big influencer with imbalances. And often because how we even simply measure a gate today 
um, it, it can be a little archaic, right? We're, we're trying to hold tolerances in our multi-cavity tools and in our parts, sometimes in, uh, you know, halves of thou's thou, sometimes within microns. And a very typical way that the industry looks at measuring a gate when they're trying to hold tight tolerances is you got a tool maker standing there, and I'm painting kind of with, a, again, a broad brush here, standing there with a, a, a pin gauge. So sticking a oval, or excuse me, a round piece of steel into oftentimes subgated parts into oval holes. And they stick the pin there and they go, yeah, that feels about right. And so they're not even sometimes capturing that, that actual dimension. Um, so there can be a lot left on the table there. And it doesn't take a lot when we're talking about steel variation, especially in gates, because when we look at you know, something like our radius of our flow channel to the power of four, that compounds real quickly. So very small variations can create enormous uh, imbalances. So oftentimes we're trying to constantly encourage the industry to look at better methods of measuring or quantifying gate sizes, such as uh, visions or optics, where we can measure gate area versus just looking at a minimum diameter. So I got a little off topic there for a second. Gate land geometries, runner length variations, runner sizes, you know, that's a, that's a hot topic a lot because oftentimes we don't really pay attention too much to the runner. Why? Because we're not in the business of molding runners. We're in the business of molding parts. And that can be a problem because up until the point of ejection and degating, that runner is part of your part. So everything that happens there is going to possibly influence what happens in that very important part. Sprue bushing misalignment, venting differences, ejector pins directly within the melt stream. So we sometimes end up with pins inside of the runner. Um, and it's not necessarily a super bad thing from a balance standpoint, but sometimes during like maintenance or over the life of the tool, uh, a pin might break or be replaced with a different pin of a different size or a different length. And now we end up with variation side to side in a runner. Um, so we oftentimes try to encourage people to get those out of the melt stream, uh, parting line mismatch, runner mismatch, um, uh, nozzle blockage, checking issues, uh, cold slugs, uneven clamping pressure. We get outside of the mold a little bit here when we talk about uneven clamping pressures sometimes. So in other words, a steel variation could be something like your press. If your press is misaligned, it could create a clamping variation in the tool, which would mimic a steel imbalance in the mold. So how do we identify that? Um, also our hot manifold, there's a whole nother source of possible variations. Now we're taking something that we're already very concerned about tolerances and stacking something else that is man-made on top of it that could possibly introduce variations. So hot tip variation, heater band issues, thermocouple issues, thermocouple placement, and then just general machining, right? I mean, we're manufacturing a very complex instrument when we're talking about manifolds. They're, they're very, very complicated tools to manufacture. And we're all human. And sometimes mistakes can be made. Um, and those variations, just due to general machining issues, can cause, cause problems and imbalances in, in the mold. I, I alluded to the check ring issue here. I'm going to do just a, a kind of like a shameless kind of drop here for, for SODIC, but the really nice thing about SODIC injection molding machines is you don't have to worry about check ring issues. So we kind of can at least remove one of these very many variations when we talk about uh, SODIC's two-stage um, uh, nozzle system. So let's talk more outside of steel. So let's get into shear. And in order to talk about what a shear variation is, the first thing that we do is we start getting into making sure that everybody understands a little bit more about plastic flow in general. Sometimes this could be a little bit of a review. Um, other times this is generally uh, new for people um, when we think about plastic flow. So the first thing that we always talk about is that plastic is laminar flowing. And that's a very important one to hit on because sometimes we use terminology to describe phenomenons that we're seeing cosmetically sometimes in a part, uh, or when we're talking about plastic flow in general, we use terms like, like turbulent. And we really wanna take a step back and go, okay, uh, plastic flow is, it's impossible for it to obtain turbulent flow. So if you ever see like jetting or something that looks like plastic, 
is obtaining turbulent flow coming through a gate. It's just, it's not. It can't obtain turbulent flow. And the reason we know that is that plastic, the, the highest Reynolds number that we can achieve with plastic flow, uh, with the least viscous uh, olefin going through the uh, tiniest gate at the fastest velocity, is something around the scale of like 10. Um, and if we understand what Reynolds scales is, what, uh, what that is describing is when a substance of turn obtains turbulent flow, like for instance, water can obtain turbulent flow because it can reach a Reynolds number of 4,000 or higher. So when we reach that 4,000 Reynolds number, we then are entering a turbulent state. And the higher that we go up that scale up until around 10,000, we, we gain more and more turbulence, and then things start to flatline a little bit. So plastic flow really is very, very far away from ever obtaining turbulent flow. Uh, it's under 10. In most cases, plastic flow on the Reynolds scale is going to be under 1. So it's very, very far away. The other neat thing, cool thing about plastic is that it's very shear sensitive. It's a non-Newtonian material, so its uh, shear rate is going to dramatically influence its viscosity. So as things become... Uh, higher at higher shear rates, elevated shear rates, things become less viscous and easier to flow. So the, the important part about these two factors is that we end up forming distinctly different laminates. Again, plastic is laminar flow. We end up forming different laminates in the runner system. The first laminate that develops is going to be our frozen layer or frozen skin. It's a very thin layer of plastic biasing the steel wall here. Once this laminate lays up against this steel, it never moves again. A uh, little uh, interesting fact. I, I think it's uh, common that people sometimes think that we're, we're uh, you know, maybe doing something by polishing runners to make it flow easier. Well, it never really actually flows up against that steel. A very thin layer develops there, and all your flow is actually happening below the frozen layer. So these laminates that are bi biasing this frozen layer, they're rubbing up against that frozen layer. So that's where all your flow is actually occurring. And so if, if you can imagine just putting your hands together and rubbing them real fast, we do, we do that up here in the north and where I live in Wisconsin uh, in the wintertime, obviously, going from building to building to keep our hands warm. The same thing's happening with plastic flow, except on a completely different scale. We can create frictional heat and shear by rubbing our hands together. Think about what that shear rate must look like and how much higher higher temperatures we're seeing with a substance that takes a ton of energy and pressure to make it move. So we are experiencing very, very high shear rates and, and very elevated temperatures by seeing this frozen layer. Meanwhile, the laminates in the center are not flowing or rubbing up against that frozen layer. So they're a much cooler, more viscous material during fill. And I just want to specify that this we're, we're talking about here is during the injection time. I, it, it is understood that during cooling, our laminates in our center are obviously the last to cool because they're the furthest away from our cold steel wall, relatively speaking. During fill, the higher shear rate, hotter plastics are biasing that frozen layer. So if you take a look at a different cross-sectional view, you kind of, during fill in the beginning, have this annular ring, of higher shearing, less viscous, much, much hotter plastics around the perimeter. So where does the problem occur? The problem occurs at intersections. That annular ring comes up to the intersection and those laminates split non-uniformly. You can see with this colored scale here, we have the higher shearing laminates staying within themselves. Again, they're not going to retain turbulent flow coming up to this intersection. Plastic doesn't come up into this intersection, tumble around and mix up and then continue along its way. Those laminates simply stay within themselves. So the laminates in this, in this uh, outside perimeter here stay within that laminate and the laminates in the center stay within those laminates of flow. So now we end up with a situation where all our higher shearing, less viscous, hotter plastics are on one side of our runner, and there's cooler, more viscous laminates on the opposite side of the runner. So again, it's it's the intersection. It's not the turn. Sometimes when, when, I, when I'll talk to people about what we're seeing, uh, the misconception is, is that by doing a turn somewhere that we're, we're creating an issue. Um, we can we can turn runners all day long. We can take this annular ring and come up to say an elevation change, 
and that annular ring is going to stay just as it is coming through these turns. It's not going to split non-uniformly, so it maintains an annular ring. We can make more turns in the runner system, and it'll still be annular coming through here. We can get real crazy and make all kinds of turns all day long, elevation changes and whatnot, but if there is no intersection, if this laminate does not split, that's what your annular ring still looks like, or that's what your, your shear profile looks like, it's still annular. So turning a runner or doing an elevation change does not change shear profile. The shear profile is still the same. Again, the intersection is the issue. When we create a split in the runner system, that's where the problem occurs. And so here we have a very typical eight cavity tool. We can see how these cavities are receiving the hotter, less viscous material. And the cavities out here are receiving the cooler, more viscous material. You can even look you know, within these parts themselves and we have variations within them where the highest shear rate develops on one side of the part. Why? Because those are the laminates that were experiencing that shear the, longer, or the longest period. So these laminates on this side of this part right here are actually hotter and less viscous than even these laminates over here. And we call that essentially an intracavity imbalance. So where one side of the part is receiving slightly higher shearing, less viscous laminates than another side of the part. So you can sometimes look at four cavity tools and from a balance standpoint, we're getting off topic just a little bit here. From a balance standpoint in terms of weight, we'll look at these and they'll weigh the same. So a person would weigh these parts on a scale on a short shot and go, my tool is balanced only from a standpoint of weight. From a standpoint of where those higher shearing laminates are developing within that cross section of that runner system and thereby influencing how it's filling apart, we can see differences. And this is actually a simulation done using mold flow. And we can actually see side to side variations within a part. So we end up with this side of the part receiving hotter, less viscous material, and this side of the part receiving slightly cooler material. So we end up with possible shrinkage variation. This cavity is going to form differently than this cavity and thereby could possibly impact dimensions. We're shrinking different. That part is forming with completely different molecular structure within the cavity itself. So we end up sometimes with four cavities where we see this kitty corner effect where these two parts will shrink or form completely different than these two cavities kitty corner to each other. So I mentioned in a hot runner doing elevation changes. Sometimes we hear people talk about elevation changes thinking that they're going to solve an imbalance because we're turning the runner system. Again, turning the runner system doesn't alleviate an imbalance. In a hot runner system, our first intersection is actually at the base of our sprue. So we have our annular ring here coming at the nozzle to sprue interface. The annular ring comes up to the first intersection, which is at the base of the sprue to the primary runner system, and those laminates split, and they continue on their way. So at this branch right here, we don't have an annular ring. We kind of have this uh, half moon or crescent or higher shearing laminates biasing the top or A side of this runner, and those laminates are going to continue to come up to this turn, and they're going to stay within themselves. So they kind of, if you will, cascade or, or waterfall down on this side. And those laminates will develop on this side of the runner and the cooler laminates on this side of the runner. Now we end up with a situation where these cavities out here are receiving the higher shearing, less viscous laminates versus cooler, more viscous laminates in the center. And again, when we're talking about hot runners, sometimes people go, well, wait a minute, it's a hot runner. Isn't that plastic always hot? So is there really a frozen layer that develops? There isn't necessarily a frozen layer in a hot runner system, but the laminates biasing the steel wall inside of that manifold those laminates biasing that steel wall are at a relatively, a relative crawl to the laminates underneath it. So we still have that same shear imbalance and those laminates are rubbing up against that, what we would just maybe refer to it as a, a no flow layer. So a laminate that's really crawling relative to the laminates underneath it. So even a simple two drop system, we can end up with situations where this annular ring splits at this intersection that we're talking about right here at the base of the sprue, carry itself to and within a drop, 
And even on a simple two cavity tool, we can sometimes end up with issues in a hot runner system. Let's say we're molding like a, a part that needs to be round, like a cup or a syringe or something that we're gating on the, in the middle to maintain concentricity. We end up with an imbalance creating side to side filling imbalances, wrap around situations, warpage situations, um, even uh, issues with flatness at the, at the base of that cup. There's a lot of problems that can, that can arise, even from a simple two drop system. These parts were, are gonna weigh the same, but they can possibly feel different. Core deflection, all types of things can develop as a result of this. Now let's talk about, you know, higher cavitation runners. So this is a hot to cold system. That two drop system carries to and within the runner system. So we end up with those higher shearing laminates coming up to this turn, dropping down this side of the runner system. And we end up in a situation where these cavities on the outside are gonna receive hotter, less, less viscous material and fill quicker. And the cavities in the center receive slightly cooler, more viscous material. So flow groups, again, how do, we, how do we determine the number of flow groups? And then where do we go from there? So the cool thing about plastic flow is that it's very, very predictable um, in terms of identifying these flow groups. It does the same thing all the time. It's just understanding the science of plastic flow. And what we want to do is when we're, when we're identifying flow groups, the first step is to identify what we've referred to as flow group one. And that is your flow group that is receiving the highest shearing, highest shearing, least viscous laminates in the entire system. And it's very easy to do. Oftentimes, um, if you just take your, your finger or pen and you can put it up against the runner system, or even in, in a paper model or on the screen model, just set your pointer up against the, the outer perimeter of this runner system and just follow that runner to and within itself. Again, so we come up to this intersection, we're gonna stay on this side. So just imagine your finger hitting the end of this runner. And when it comes up to this, you're just going to stay within this section. We come up to this intersection, your runner's gonna, your finger's gonna hit, or your pen's gonna hit this runner branch. And then it's gonna follow up around this turn. It's gonna stay here. And then it hits this section of this cavity right here. We can do that to all of these cavities over here. It's very easy to trace that first to fill flow group. And we're gonna identify very easily flow group number one. So these cavities here, all receiving the exact same material properties. Therefore, these four cavities here should fill and weigh the same. The cavities um, on the outside are receiving a different set of melt properties. So now we can really start to group things out by flow group, meaning looking at shears or shear groups. And then we can also look at regions of the tool to start helping to identify sources of seal imbalance. So the first thing that we'll do is identify region A, which is over in this quadrant, region B over here, C right below it, and D back over here. So now what we can do is relabel all these cavities to distinctly identify regions within the tool. So we have 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D. And then we have flow group two. Now we have flow group 2A, we have 2B, 2C, and 2D. And we're gonna explain why we do this here in a minute, but this is how we can start to separate flow groups and then regions of steel. <clears throat> Excuse me. So even a simple four cavity tool, we can end up with two distinct flow groups. I mentioned the four cavity tool earlier that had one intersection. We can bounce back to it real quick here. We have one intersection in this four cavity tool here. When we have two intersections in a four cavity tool for reasons of mold construction, maybe we have a slide on one side of our tool. So to, to construct it easier, we put all the cavities in line. We have two flow groups. We have two intersections. We have an intersection here. And we have an intersection over here. We end up with two distinct flow groups. These laminates here stay within themselves. Again, just imagine your finger up against this runner system, hitting this runner, hitting this runner, and staying within itself. So we have flow group one. Again, split the tool into regions, region A, region B, and then identify your second flow group, 2A and 2B over here. So we have a two flow group, four cavity tool. It all depends on the runner layout as to how many flow groups you're going to have. 
And we can continue to develop these. Again, we have a 16 cavity tool here. First thing we do is identify flow group one, trace that first to fill flow group, and everything else will fall in line. We have flow group one here in these cavities. Split the tool into regions. We have region A, B, C, and D. And then start to identify, excuse me, I got ahead of myself there. Then start to identify the other flow groups. So we have flow group 2A, 2B, 2C, 2D. And then the differences between three and four are gonna be subtle, but they are also different flow groups. So they, in a 16 cavity tool, we essentially have four distinctly different flow groups. We have four sets of cavities essentially that are filling completely different than their neighbor, different material properties, I should say. So flow group, flow grouping is simply there to just isolate your steel versus your shear variations. And that's gonna allow you to concentrate on your rip costs. I mentioned earlier, I said these four cavities are all filling with the same melt properties. Therefore, they should fill and weigh the same. If these four cavities out here or in the center, if these four cavities within themselves don't weigh the same, then it's a steel imbalance. So these four blue cavities, they're all receiving the same melt properties, meaning the same laminates, the same distinct laminates. Therefore, they should weigh the same. If they don't weigh the same, it's going to be a steel imbalance that we, uh, that we illustrated earlier. A shear variation is going to be a variation between flow groups. So the, the variation between this flow group and this flow group here is a result of a shear imbalance, meaning it has to do with the split of those melt properties at these intersections. So how do we start to identify, once we look at these flow groups, how do we quantify this data? What do we do with this information once we identify flow groups? <laughs> the first thing that we do with our mold is we run a short shot. And when I talk about short shots, sometimes that's a, a term used a little loosely in our industry. Sometimes when, they, when people talk about running a short shot, their envision of a short shot is, is sometimes a transfer position. So where they're switching from first stage to second stage. At that point in time, <clears throat> for the most part, most tools, look very uniform at that point because we've created a lot of hesitation. We got some cavities at around 98% full, 95% full. Other cavities are starting to catch up already at that point in time. We hesitated the flow front, other cavities are coming up to those cavities and we end up maybe making ourselves feel better about the balance of the tool because the numbers look closer because we introduced hesitation. The plastic became harder to fill to those first to fill cavities, so it simply went to where it's easier to flow. Plastic always goes to where it's easier to flow. So when a flow front hesitates, it just goes somewhere else if that option is available. So what we want to do when we look at short shots is we want to fill our cavities to around 70 to 80 percent full visually. So the first thing to do is establish a current and standard optimized process for the mold. In other words, get the tool up and running like you would be in production. Then we're gonna remove our hold pressures or set those pressures to the machines, excuse me, set those hold pressures to the, the machine's minimum value. So essentially we're not packing these parts. We want first stage velocity control only at around 70 to 80% full visually. And then we're gonna just simply collect three to five short shots at that same process. And the reason why I specify at that same process is sometimes in order to gather our short shots or identify where those short shots are in the tool, we sometimes have to stop the mold, pick them out by hand so we know their position within the tool because sometimes we can't identify our cavities because our cavity ID might be at the end of fill and it's not there. So we might sometimes have to write these numbers on the part as they come out, tape them, However, you got to do in order to identify where they are positionally wise within that tool. Um, and then once that happens, now we have this material that's just sitting inside that barrel, just baking away. Um, so what we want to do is get that machine back up and running, get some fresh material in there like we would be in production. And then once again, go ahead and gather your next short shot. You might have to do that a couple of times. It's a little painful, but I promise you it's all worthwhile at the end of the day. So we keep each short shot separate in a separate bag and we mark these individually. Uh, we then are going to weigh each one of these parts and then we're gonna document it on a cavity ID map. 
So we make sure that we know again where that part is coming from within that runner system. So the conventional way of identifying this is you'll typically have this cavity ID map that shows you the, each individual cavities identification and where it is within the tool. And then we put these numbers into a spreadsheet. We get data that looks something like this. And this is very frustrating, right? Because there's no recognizable information here that alludes to where these imbalances are coming from. It's just raw data. This is typically where we get to this point. Um, and again, I'm painting kind of with a broad brush here. We'll get to this point and we take this information as say a process engineer and we go, holy cow, this tool is imbalanced. And we send it right over to the mold maker. And we go, you did something wrong here. We have imbalances, you need to fix this so that I can process this tool better because we don't want imbalances. And then the tool maker is looking at this data and it's, and it's, well, where do I even start? Do I just start measuring gates? I don't know why these parts are weighing something different than others. I pin gauged everything. We were holding pretty tight tolerances. I don't know where to begin. So the organization is, is, is essentially complicated at this point in time and identifying where it's coming from. So when we look at this data, this is actually real information here from a mold years ago that we looked at. This shows that at 70, 80% full, we had some parts that were almost 50% or a little over 50% heavier than other cavities. So what do we wanna do? Well, we wanna separate these steel and shear variations like we talked about earlier. And by doing, by doing that and separating our flow groups, we can better understand where these imbalances are stemming from. So to calculate our, or, or determine our steel variation, we're gonna take our minimum weight within one flow group. So looking at flow group one here, and we're gonna divide that by our maximum weight within that flow group, multiply it by 100 and take one, subtract one minus this number. That's going to give our percent imbalance within that given flow group. And we can do that each time for each one of these flow groups and very easily calculate our, our imbalance within the flow group. We then can identify what our shear imbalance is. And again, that's also very easy. We take our heaviest flow group and we essentially take our meet, or excuse me, our, our minimum flow group, our lightest flow group, and we apply some of the same principles. We take this number here, we divide that average weight here from this average weight within this flow group. We multiply it by 100, take one minus that number, and it gives us our shear imbalance. We have a negative 31.6% shear variation. And negative is illustrating an under rotation. So we have laminates that are coming within the center of the tool are hotter within this flow group here. So, by, by identifying these flow groups, we can basically take this raw data that we saw earlier here and organize it into something that looks like this. So it's much more easy to read. And now we can start to look at this information and help identify where the imbalances are stemming from. So we know a major imbalance is this 31.6. That's a result of the split of the non-uniform melt properties at our intersections. The root cause of these numbers here are all steel. So the first thing that we know, we know that we have a problem with the split of these melt properties at this intersection. We can get to some solutions for that later on. We know that that is a problem. What do we do from a standpoint of steel? If I send this tool to mold maker and, and we got numbers that look like this, where do I have him look first? Well, the cool thing about organizing the data like this is it allows us to recognize patterns sometimes. So when we look at this information, we have all our different quadrants, again, labeled A, B, C, D, and we do that for every single one of the flow groups, we organize the data within those regions, and we then now look at this data differently. We can <clears throat> recognize a pattern right away. We see quadrant A and quadrant D are always filling slightly heavier or faster than our, our regions B and C. So where are those within our cavity ID map? We got A quadrant right here, or region, excuse me, and we have region D right below it. So A and D are always filling faster than B and C. So we literally have this side of our tool filling faster from a steel standpoint 
and this side of our tool. So if I were a mold maker and I was going, okay, this side of my tool is filling faster than this side of my tool. The first thing I would do or wouldn't do would be start to measure every single one of these gates. Because what are the chances that all of these gates on this side of the tool are larger than all the cavities on this side of the tool or all the gates? The first thing I would do would probably be looking at this primary runner here. Is this runner, which feeds this whole half of the tool a different size slightly from this runner over here? So I want to identify what's the lowest hanging fruit, right? Where would, where would, what would cause this side of the tool to feel faster than this side? I'd look at that primary runner right away. And then this one, I uh, don't have the numbers up on here, but on this one, this was an actual um, example here. This imbalance or this, this dimension issue, this side of the runner was around five thousandths larger than this side of the runner. So it didn't take a whole ton. Again, the reason why is even though it's only five thousandths of an inch, that number is compounded to the power of four. So that, that is going to cause a significant pressure variation side to side in that hole. So once we understand all this plastic flow and we can start to look at larger cavitation tools, things get pretty daunting. And it also allows us to recognize, holy cow, in our really high cavitation tools, we got a lot going on. We got a lot of different flow groups. We got a lot of different cavities doing a lot of different things. And that is why in high production and high cavitation tools, it can become cumbersome to quali excuse me, qualify these molds because we have a lot of different flow groups. We have a lot of different information here, a lot of different cavities doing different things, which is why identifying these things is so much more important um, than just laying all these uh, on a generic graph. And this can become complicated. And you look at this and you almost start to hyperventilate a little bit. Um, and, and trying to figure out how to map all this out on your own can be very complicated. But we have made it uh, pretty pretty easy for you to do. Well, there is a website that you can go to that we created called moldinggenius.com, where we have all these maps that look like this and this already developed for you. And if there's a runner configuration up there that you can't identify or you have a hot manifold that you want to look at, you just call us. Uh, we have numbers on the Molding Genius website once you sign up for it. And we will help you figure that, that layout out. And we do all that kind of stuff, that initial consultation, or just helping you generally better understand your, your mold. We do that for free at Beaumont. We want people to learn this stuff. We want you to understand the importance of flow grouping. And we wanna give you tools to become better at what you're doing. At the end of the day, as an industry as a whole, if we can understand these things better, we can develop faster solutions and we can become a heck of a lot more efficient and better at our job. So there's a lot there. Uh, one last plug, I just wanna give, we're getting kind of short on time here. We've got only about 10, 15 minutes left here. Uh, one last plug is back to Sodic again. I know a lot of you are already on their mailing list. Uh, but SODIC is doing a great job with their webinar series. I hope you stay tuned to some of the other events that they have going on. A lot of great information, a lot of, of uh, very good technical information um, that, again, is just there to, to help us, uh, again, do better at what we're doing. And hopefully we're not all getting <laughs> a little too burnt out on, on the whole webinar thing. Um, it's been going on for probably about six months, I think, everybody's doing webinars, but I still do them. I think they're great. They're very informational. If you ever want to visit our websites, we have two websites. Uh, we have our BeaumontInc.com website, which is for our company Beaumont. And then we have our AIM Institute, which is all education. Um, so we, we really are a family of companies. Our Beaumont Technologies services our melt flipper technology. Some of you may kind of knew that coming into this presentation when I'm talking about full grouping. We essentially developed a way of correcting that shear imbalance at the intersection by a simple design of a runner system. And we can do that in runners that are cold and in runners that are hot. So the Beaumont Technologies portion of our company services our melt flipper technology and our molding genius. We have a section of our company called Beaumont Development. That portion of our company is all of our mold flow services and consulting. Uh, we are certified expert mold flow consultants. We are GM certified, one of the very few in the nation. Um, we, 
three years ago now, took over Moldflow's material characterization lab in Ithaca, New York, and handled their characterization in partnership for them or with them at our facility in Erie, Pennsylvania. So uh, we are the company that you can go to to characterize any of your polymers for mold flow. Uh, we also sell uh, mold flow and train on how to use it. Uh, so we're a partner of Autodesk. We sell their software and it can help you learn how to use that and, and become better at that. Uh, Beaumont Advanced Processing over here is where we do all of our test specimen molding and the company that actually does the material characterization itself. It is ISO 9001 and also 13485. And then the last is the American Injection Molding Institute. The AIM Institute has been around for the better part of almost seven, six, seven years now. Uh, we offer the only uh, ANSI accredited plastics training program in the world, the PTE certificate program. So we have some very advanced education helping to create better plastics engineers. So that is all I have for today. Um, I guess at this point in time, as Bennett and Weston uh, mentioned earlier, at this point in time, we'll, we'll open it up to some questions if you have any. Great, thank you, Kevin. Uh, great, great stuff today. Um, have some questions rolling in, so I think we'll we'll just jump right into it. Okay. Uh, All right. Sounds first great. one that came in is, how does LCP affect the shear imbalance? How does LCP? Is that what you said? Yes, sir. LCP is a significant is significantly affected by shear imbalances. I think if you're molding LCP, you already know how shear sensitive this polymer is. It is very unique and very different. Uh, we know that LCP is like shear from a standpoint of, of flowing and becoming less viscous. And I, you, you oftentimes see an LCP with a packing related issue. And oftentimes in our industry, the first thing that we wanna do is increase our runner size to try to influence packing. Um, but LCP really, again, likes that shear rate. So we sometimes will actually make our runners smaller to influence our ability to adequately pack them out. Pressures can sometimes decrease significantly. So it's very affected by shear, which means that that shear profile is intense. So we end up with some major imbalances. Um, so in multi-cavity tools, with uh, with LCPs, our melt flipper technology is going to be very advantageous there. It's going to follow the same principles from a flow grouping standpoint. Any polymer that is a thermoplastic or a thermal set, uh, if it's a, 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 a non-Newtonian material that exhibits laminar flow, it's going to be very easy to trace these imbalances and identifying these flow groups. So yeah, that's, uh, I hopefully that answers that question. If it doesn't, just ping me and we can go through things uh, uh, later as well. Excellent. Uh, next question here for you. How does a cold slug at each turn affect flow imbalance? Good question. So cold slug or um, a cold slug well, um, essentially when, when, we, when we have a cold slug, we, we almost instantaneously create a dead spot in our plastic flow. Uh, so the, the plastic is going to come up to the intersection. Uh, let's see if we can pull this picture back up here. I'm not sure why, here we go. We're gonna come back here a minute. Bear with me one second. So in this picture here, I illustrated these laminates coming up to this intersection and staying within themselves. Um, one of the things that, one of the first things I can remember from some of the classes that I took outside of Beaumont was listening to John Bazzelli. And if you've been in an injection molding for any number of years, I'm sure you uh, can, uh, can understand the impact that this gentleman has had in the industry and his understanding of plastic flow. And one of the things that he, uh, I'll, I'll never forget him telling me or explaining to me is how plastic comes up to an intersection and how it always, again, takes the path of least resistance and just immediately goes to where it's easier to flow. He said, imagine plastic like you were blowing almost like a balloon up in a runner system. And the second that it had the opportunity to go somewhere to easier to flow, it'll take that opportunity. So plastic coming up to an intersection, plastic again exhibits a parabolic flow front We'll come up to this intersection, and I'm, I'm, I'm embellishing a little bit here, 
but it essentially flows into an intersection like this. So it doesn't come up into our cold slug well. Let's draw on a cold slug well here. It doesn't shoot into a cold slug well and then go this direction. Because plastic is so viscous, it immediately just starts expanding and staying within those laminates. So once this plastic then that flow front reaches this point, this cold slug well is going to fill up and then it becomes a dead spot. There's no more flow here happening. Plastic is going to now just essentially reorientate itself at this point and start that radial or that parabolic flow front heading down in these directions here. Hopefully that answers that question. Good, good. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, next one for the hot runner shear imbalance. Does the length of the sprue in the examples you showed have an influence on the amount of shear imbalance that develops? Absolutely. So a good illustration of that or a good topic conversation to have when we talk about sprue length. So uh, kind of like a, I'll, I'll do a two parter here. How we calculate or design our melt flipper geometry that we put in this intersection right here is all based on our sprue inlet and outlet diameters and then the length of this sprue and then the length of this primary runner system and the radius of that primary runner system. So the calculation of the amount of rotation that we put on at these intersections for melt flipper are based on those things. So that shear profile is going to become more intense the longer this sprue. So in a hot runner system, the longer this sprue or your nozzle Right? So sometimes with really big molds that have six, seven, eight, nine, 10 inch long, 12 inch long nozzles, that shear profile is developing there. Our shear profile is developing the moment we start pushing on plastics in the injection molding machine. The minute those laminates start moving forward and progressing towards that nozzle and into the nozzle, that shear profile is forming. And so with hot runner molds, we, we, if we have sometimes shorter ones here, we maybe see a less of an impact into the uh, multi-cavity tool. If it's longer, it could be more impactful. But then if it's shorter, perhaps the, the sprue or the nozzle or the nozzle up front is longer in order to reach into the mold. So that shear profile can change its, in its intensity. So we need to understand and calculate that in order to design and accommodate our geometry at the intersections. And also think about other molds outside of conventional hot runners. Let's talk about stack tools for just a quick second. Stack tools, we have a really long sprue bar. So if you ever run a short shot on a stack mold, everybody knows that the A side of that stack mold, the, the, the split on the side nearest to the stationary side of the tool, that side, actually always fills faster than the B side, if you will, the movable side of the tool. And that's because those laminates coming up to the intersection, I'll draw this out real quick. When we have that sprue bar coming in to our split between the halves, that annular ring is continuing and then coming up to this intersection and splitting non-uniformly towards the A half. This is our injection unit over here. Um, and then we have our split going to our various halves here. Those laminates just stay within themselves and bias that A side of the tool. So great question. Sprue length, nozzle, all these things can influence how big of an impact we have in terms of separating our flow groups out, in terms of the, the intensity or the variation from uh, flow group one to the subsequent, subsequent flow groups. Great question. And as a second part to that question, Kevin. Um, yes. But the sprue typically much larger than the manifold channels. Um, a percentage of the flow, the amount of molecules being impacted by shear are less. Correct. I'm sorry. Can you explain that again? Uh, yeah. Can you say that again? And isn't the sprue typically much larger than the manifold channels? And therefore, as a percentage of the flow, the amount of molecules being impacted by shear are less. 
So the larger your channel size, I, I don't know if that's necessarily the case all the time, but it, uh, to, to say that your, your larger di diameters are less affected by shear, the answer to that is yes. But understand that that's just one part of the equation. We have to understand what the specific viscosity variations are for that type of polymer. Someone mentioned earlier LCPs are much more affected by shear rates um, versus maybe an olefin. Uh, also, how long that 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 runner is. You might have a very short, chubby runner uh, versus a very long, skinny runner that that's going to be affected differently. But if you have a chubby runner over a very long flow length or a long, large sprue over a long flow length, you can still end up with a severe short shear profile. Shear, when we talk about shear and how we calculate shear, isn't just temperature; it's also time. So the the time or the length that it's experiencing that shear rate up against that wall that's where we see the impact um john beaumont when i first started with beaumont technology said something that's always stuck with me he's like when we talk about shear and how this is developing time is very important if i were to walk up to um an iron a hot iron and i'm ironing a shirt in the morning um i can walk up to the iron in order to make sure that it's hot I can take my finger and I can tap it for, for a short period of time. And I could do that over and over and over and over again and probably not burn my fingers too bad. But if I were to take my finger and I put it up against that hot iron and I leave it there, I'm going to burn my finger. Why? Because it's experiencing it for a longer period of time. So time is just as much of a factor as how hot that temperature is. Hopefully that helps answer that. Excellent. Very good. Uh, a couple more here for you. Besides using the melt flipper, what other strategies or design changes would you suggest before building the tool in order to minimize shear uh, imbalance? Yeah, great question. So runner layouts are always important. There's always different types of layouts that you can do in order to mitigate some issues. Um, what what I would always tell you is that the neat thing about working with Beaumont is that we're very transparent. Um, and not to sound too salesy there, but you got a multi-cavity tool that you're about to build, send it over to us. We're not here to just make a quick buck, right? You can send it over to us, send us your layout. And if we look at it and go, geez, you know, if you did this with this part, or if you did this with this layout, we could probably mitigate a few things here and make things better. I have no problem giving you that information. So that's a very, what I would just say is a very broad question that's going to have specific answers based upon the specific situation at hand. I don't have any general rules of thumb for you other than the fact that the more that you understand what I just went over right now, which will happen over time. When I was first exposed to flow groups very early on, I had no idea how to re-explain that or how to map things out. It took a while to really be able to trace these out, especially when we get into complex systems, especially hot runners, because they have all kinds of turns and changes. So in order to trace those shear profiles out and understand how it's positioning within even a cavity can become complicated. But once you start learning more and more about this, we even have classes that you can take on understanding more about plastic flow, you'll be able to answer some of those questions yourself. Or again, feel free to send this stuff over to us. That initial consultation conversations that I have with you are free. We'll talk about it and look at that specific question. Excellent. Uh, the last question I have here, and unless we have a couple more come in, what is the impact of injection velocity? You know, fast fill versus slow fill. Very, very good question. Uh, so the higher the shear rate can depend upon the injection velocity dramatically. The faster you fill, the higher shear rates you get. You probably can see this very easily. Sometimes the easiest way to see this is with hot runner molds because you can actually look sometimes at those temperatures jumping uh, in, inside of uh, manifolds at different zones depending upon your injection velocity. We can see temperatures rise or you could take a um, thermocouple and stick it in some melt that you're purging out at different velocities or, or a thermocouple within a mold and look at how it, it changes its temperature based upon 
injection velocities, the higher fill rates will see higher shear temperatures and higher melt temperatures. Uh, years ago, uh, some students at Penn State Barron at the plastics program there, they built a mold that had uh, uh, no end of fill. Uh, a better way to explain it, it had a runner that, a sprue and a runner that just kind of wrapped around in the mold and then just bent it out of the parting line of the tool. And what they were able to do is they built a, uh, a little beaker um, that they were able to stick underneath the mold with a very long handle. And they shot plastic in at different melt temperatures. They did different, different types of polymers. And they did inject different fill rates. And they got all kinds of different temperature readings coming out of this mold. So it, it, that's all happening because of that fill rate, right? And the amount of shear that is experiencing within that tool. Uh, the whole purpose of that really was to, uh, to better understand the impactfulness of this, this, this shear thinning up against the frozen layers. Really cool information that came out of that. I actually have slides on this if you ever want to go over this uh, or have this person um, send me an email. Is what they did is they shot all this plastic into this beaker going through a cold mold and then they backed the sled up and they shot plastic directly out of the nozzle and into the beaker. And the coolest thing about it was it was very, very neat to see how the temperature of the plastic coming out of the nozzle, fresh hot plastic, was actually colder than the plastic coming out of the cold mold. There's something to think about for a second. We're talking about plastic coming out of a relatively cold mold is hotter than the plastic coming out of the fresh injection unit because of this sheer thinning of the material because of this very thin layer of plastic biasing the frozen layer. That thin layer of plastic is so much hotter that it's, it's, it was affecting the bulk temperature of the plastic coming out of the parting line of the mold by as much as 100 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than the plastic coming out of the nozzle. So it's hot. <laughs> That shear profile or that thin layer, that hotter laminate is much, much hotter than the laminates in the center of the flow channel. Excellent, excellent. Any um, other questions? Yeah, I got one more just came in as you were finishing up there. Question Wonderful. is, what, what do you recommend for an acceptable baseline for cavity imbalance within flow groups? So what we've always used as a rule of thumb, and I'm going to just take a step back for one second. When I say rule of thumb, I don't mean gospel. <laughs> Sometimes people, I am painting again with a broad brush here in our industry, when they hear a rule of thumb, they go, okay, that's what I'm going to use all the time. What we use as a rule of thumb uh, for imbalances is with our steel imbalance versus our shear imbalance, we want to see steel imbalances of 5% or less. So from, a, these are showing different flow groups. Uh, when you use the Molding Genius, we do a max steel imbalance. We want to see 5% or less in that max steel imbalance, the heaviest cavity to the lightest cavity. And then our shear imbalance, we want to see 5% uh, or less in terms of our heaviest to fill flow group versus our lightest to fill flow group. Again, when I say rule of thumb, if you're running a mold and you go, well, shoot, Kevin said that I got a, that here I have a 4% 4, 4 steel variation and I have a 5% shear variation, but I still have inconsistent parts. He told me 5%, rule of thumb, meaning that if you're still having issues from a consistency standpoint, you still have some cavities doing something different than other cavities, we, need to, we may need to be tighter on that imbalance because of the specific requirements of that part, that material, right? So if it's a, if it's a part that you're trying to maintain, you know, half a thou tolerance or zero tolerance in some area, we might have to get tighter than a 5% shear variation. We might have to get tighter than a 5% steel variation. I have some customers that don't expect a total imbalance of 5% or less, 3% um, or less. It just depends on the requirement of that mold and that part. So hopefully that helps answer that question. But it gives you at least a, we feel that 5% you should be able to process mm -hmm. through it in most situations. 
Wonderful. Um, I guess uh, we, we can give a couple more minutes here to see if there's any further questions, uh, Kevin, that come in. Yeah, During that, sure. I uh, just follow up on what Bennett had mentioned prior to the, the presentation, and that's a few uh, upcoming webinars that we're gonna be doing. Uh, got a couple with material suppliers, uh, some LCP material, some uh, implantable materials, the compounders for those. So we have some some great uh, great topics along that line, as well as some tool builders um, that are going to be presenting for us as well. So um, I guess with that said, if there's no further questions, uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Kevin, for presenting. I uh, really Absolutely. appreciate everyone's time today. Have a have a great rest of your day. Wonderful. If anybody ever has any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'm sure Sodic will send you my contact information. Absolutely. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Kevin. See ya. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.